Good morning, everybody. Good morning, morning. excellent. Um, for those of you who weren't speaking loud enough, there's coffee over to the side. Uh, welcome to Grab Coffee. Um, today's events are really meant to be uh, relatively informal, uh, in part to be able to really animate the kind of conversation. Um, but I want to start by, uh, by first welcoming you to the second day of the third biennial conference, Timber in the City. Uh, my name is David Lewis, and I'm a professor here at Parsons and a principal of LTL Architects. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be able to greet you this morning and want to start by thanking the sponsor, the Binational Software Lumber Council, led by Kista Jagger, for underwriting of today's events and for their ongoing support of the Parallel Student Design Competition, uh, also called Timber in the City. That competition is organized by Parsons and run in association with the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture, or ACSA. This year, the competition, which is due in the spring of 2019, challenges participants to reimagine a vacant waterfront site in Queens uh, as a vibrant and vanguard model of healthy biophilic living for the future of the city with mass timber as the catalyst for design innovation. The conference today will provide a key source of material for students, faculty, and practitioners who are taking on this competition, as well as to further the general conversation about mass timber and its relationship to architecture and the future of the discipline. No doubt, there's currently a significant number of conferences, books, reports on the benefits and challenges of using engineered timber or mass timber to realize new buildings. At a time in which the global impact of CO2 is well known, the benefits of building out of timber, a renewable resource that is carbon sequestering, is obvious and clear. The question that this conference is seeking to raise is, what is at stake for architecture? What is at stake for interior design, and what is at stake for cities? What are the opportunities for architecture and urbanism today and in the future in adopting and inventing through mass timber? The three panels planned today will address these and parallel questions through a focus first on timber today, then on the environmental and health, human health potentials of timber, and concluding on the interplay between the challenges of increased urbanization and the impacts on forests and rural communities. Each panel is composed of two or three speakers who, following short individual presentations, will be joined together by a moderator who will look to tease out the salient and critical questions by the esteemed presenters, um, and then with an audience uh, question and answer to follow. Without further ado, let's begin with the first panel. Uh, comprised of Tom Chung of Lear's Weinzaffel Associates, Michelle Ruloffs of Arup, and moderated by Andy Bernheimer of Bernheimer Architects and Parsons School of Design. Framed around the title Timber Today, this first panel is intended to set today's, the stage for today's events, including key issues of technology, culture, materials, and design. I'm very pleased that Tom, Tom Chung will be opening today's presentation as one of the leading architects working in timber in America. Tom is a principal of Lear's Wines Apple, a decorated firm known for the exceptional work on academic campuses from Harvard to Penn to Arkansas. In addition to his decades of practice at the highest level, Tom teaches and lectures extensively and a critical and important voice on the future of timber in architecture. Will you please join me in welcoming Tom Chung. Thank you, David, for the introduction. And, uh, Thank you everybody for joining us uh, this morning. Glad to see a lot of the students this early. I know usually it's a lot of late nighters. We used to call architecture architecture when I was back in school. Don't know if that's still the case or not, but I'm sure there's still a lot of late nights. Maybe I have to stand back there. We'll see. There we go. <laughs> so my presentation is titled Mass Timber. Architectural Opportunities in the Digital Age. So I'm going to talk broadly about what's current in today's mass timber design and talk also about some of the dangers I think that we face as a design industry and also talk more specifically about my work, our work as a firm in terms of the two projects that we've been able to work on so far. So the material that I'm going to present that's work of our firm really just is a collective work. We're a collaborative practice. We're from the very new 
as an employee to the founding principles, work collaboratively in a practice where best ideas get due attention and we work together as a team. So the work that we're showing is the work of our firm collectively. The role of timber has been in the mind of architecture for a very long time, right? The primitive hut theorized the, the origins of architecture in timber. And we've seen many iterations of this from the very early structures, log cabins, very simple structures, to barns and timbers, uh, heavy timber structures that built a lot of our cities at the turn of the century. The medieval cities of Europe, this happens to be Dornstedt in Germany. You could go to every town, cities in Europe, and you can find these types of heavy timber structures. In Asia, go to any of the villages, and you see beautiful architecture, traditional architecture of timber. Even in the States, in the Wild West, as the country was being uh, settled, Dodge City, a uh, preeminent example of that in Kansas, timber construction. But then, as we all know, something happened at the turn of the Industrial Revolution, where some of the foreground buildings that you see here, masonry buildings with timber structure, started getting replaced by steel in a rush to develop bigger, develop taller. And steel became really the material of the 19th century. And in the 20th century, replaced by concrete as the primary structural material. So what does that leave timber today? And I think there's a lot of mythology about timber that's kind of preventing it from its advance in the minds of the collective public. When we think of timber construction, perhaps many people outside of the design profession still think of something like this, that it's a, really a hands-on practice with anybody doing the work, right? You could just go to Home Depot, get some lumber, and do some, more, some of this work yourself. But timber, and specifically mass timber in the digital age, is a very different product and a process. Here's just some of the samplings from cross-laminated timber to DLT, dowel laminated timber, to one of the newer products, mass plywood panel. These are highly engineered products that require a digital fabrication uh, and a, pr a production process. So here's some uh, automated process of putting together the different laminations, getting ready to go into the press, which is producing a, a panel of cross-laminated timber. It's being lifted up by vacuum lifts, going through a CNC routing machine, in which all of that is pre-determined by a computer software using the best algorithms in terms of how to make the most efficient piece of it out of a panel with as little waste as possible. And all of that is being designed already by the architect, the, the engineer, and the production team. Here's the end of the CLT panel being routed for a joint. And that five axis milling machine allows you to do pretty much anything that you can think of. Perhaps we had done this centuries ago by master craftsmen in Japan, or in China, or in Korea, making really intricate details and connections, but the ability to do this at mass scale uh, is the product of the digital revolution that makes this available, this technology available to everybody today. So you can do complex joints like this, requiring extensive intricacies of connection between steel and timber. This is a joint at every single one of these joints which have different geometries. This is a Frank Gehry project, Art Gallery of Ontario designed in terms of the structural connections by Equilibrium Consultings, whom we had the uh, pleasure of working together in our buildings. You can do large span structures. This is the Olympic Oval at the 2010 Vancouver Olympics. And now, in the world of timber today, kind of the, the, the new topic in vogue, the tall buildings. Brock Commons at University of British Vancouver, I think currently still the tallest building in North America. And we look, go back and look at Corbusier's Maison Domino, right? the quintessential uh, influence in terms of concrete construction, 
that allowed to, us to achieve the free plan. And that was realized in Mass Timber back in 2014, Venice Biennale. And you can see with especially products like cross-laminated timber, with the ability to span two directions and cantilever out, that you can see what was impossible before in timber because of the advancements in technology and engineering. You can now do uh, what was done in concrete and timber. And so again, going back to broad comments, a perfect example of that, that same system with columns, no beams, slab of CLT spanning both directions. So why does this all matter today? Why now in the 21st century? Two words, climate change. I won't go too much into this. I think everybody knows the effects of the wildfires, the droughts, the storms. We've experienced it here in New York City, Hurricane Sandy, which was, came on board as only a category one. I think just went into a, as a tropical storm. But the amount of damage that caused in terms of the flooding levels and the rise of seawater, all of these things, we're seeing the impacts. This is Seoul, Korea, 2018. I was just there in the summer. And you can see just the city of concrete there. And, and this is not just a, a bad day I took this picture in. This is like every day like this, the smog and the carbon emissions that's really compromising our quality of life in our urban centers. And it's going to get worse, right? We all know these statistics. 70,000, 70% 70 of people will be back in cities by 2050. 70 new million houses to be built for the expanding populations. And in terms of the global energy use, buildings account for nearly 50% of that. So we're a big contributor in this. 30 to 40% of emission of greenhouse gases and carbon emissions. And with steel, the extraction, the energy of production, same thing with concrete, extraction, production. These have been great tools in terms of how we've modernized and built our cities, but we're at a precipice where we can't ignore this equation anymore. And so maybe there's a new birth in timber, a renewable resource that if managed properly can be harvested and grown back. Here's a forest being grow regrowing five years after its harvest. And the process of harvest and production is fairly energy, uh, is redu reduced in energy compared to steel and concrete. You're essentially debarking the wood, cutting it into smaller pieces, and gluing it back into an engineered product. So when you took it, look at the whole embodied energy from extraction, processing, transportation, construction to disposal, it's a fraction of what it is in steel and concrete. So this was our uh, prerogative, what we were trying to do when we had the opportunity at the John Oliver Design Building at UMass Amherst. So we started this project in 2013, and it was completed last year. The setting for this project was in rural western Massachusetts at an urban campus right in the center. So a, big, a greater density within this area of very low density. And we were inspired by the context of the historic tobacco barns, the agrarian fields, the forests nearby. And the project was to really bring together three departments of the build environment, architecture, landscape architecture, and regional planning, and building construction technology into one building where they could collaborate and study and research together. And the site was pivotal in that it was at the center of campus between the larger monumental concrete structures of the 60s and 70s in blue and shown in red, the original historic campus. And we had two different contexts in terms of scale and the feel on both sides of the building. So the idea was simple to uh, take a typical typology of a courtyard representing, symbolizing functionally and spiritually the center where everybody could gather and open it up in plan and in section to respond to the site and uh, the scale of the context so that the building would be a campus building promoting circulation and gathering a place of people. We envisioned it as a building that would be welcoming and open. And this final uh, photograph. In section, that common space divided in both a two-story and a courtyard above for uh, display and investigation of green roof technologies 
and the center would essentially gather all the program spaces of studios, conference rooms, classrooms, and make it open to the campus at the ground level. Along with the design and the investigation of the architecture and the structure of the central space, we worked back and forth iteratively with our, our landscape architect. Here's the concept sketch of the courtyard as a garden, looking at various structural systems in which could support and uh, span that space, and getting to a system in which the, the rigors of the column grid and the architectural geometry could be translated efficiently in a structural manner, a simple truss spanning a large span space, working through that in the generating the reflective ceiling plan, looking at in the process of design as all of you are familiar with, going back and forth between computers and sketches, physical models and digital models, quickly looking at that and what the implications of that is in the courtyard above, looking through the potential of skylights to bring and connect those two spaces, exploring the further and physical model in the layout of the courtyard, and finally coming together in this cross cutaway section model, showing the relationship between the courtyard elements and the structure and the space below. So all that came together in an analysis of the structural system in which about 95% of the superstructure was timber made up of glue lamp columns and beams, cross-laminated timber floor panels and roof panels, along with cross-laminated timber for the shear walls, the cores. We wrapped this in steel in a copper anodized aluminum panels, uh, given the maintenance requirements of the university. And then we set this in a concrete foundation, doing the right thing, the smart thing, keeping the wood away from moisture and contact with the ground. So here it is, about 75% complete in this uh, framing. And you can see the elements here, the glue lamp columns, the beams, the connections. You can see the cross-laminated timber panels spanning. And also you can see here the steel beams for areas where really the better use is steel given its stronger uh, structural properties for areas of transfer beams and cantilevers. It's really a hybrid buildings where we didn't have a core, we braced it with glue lamp bracing. And the ability to do that connection, which wasn't possible 15, 20 years ago, because that tight fit joint connection in which you have seven layers of wood and steel that needs to meet precisely with one 32nd inch uh, tolerance, 15 pins going through that seven layers. You just couldn't do that without a prior to uh, CNC machine and the digital fabrication technology. But that allows you to do all that work up, up front loaded. And when you come to the construction site, you're just installing it and putting a pin together and that's it. So this talks about the speed of, the potential speed of mass timber technologies and how it affects construction. And I think that's sort of one of the dangers today and we'll get into that a little bit later. Construction of the elevator shaft, one of the core shear walls. Likewise, we did that for the stairwells, stairwells as well. And in conversations with the fire marshals and building officials, we were able to reason and leave the interior of that exposed and cross-laminated timber. Floor panel being lifted up in place. The whole construction was a crew of five to seven people with one manager of the crew and one person in a crane operating a mobile crane. And we used the technology that was developed in part at the university, a uh, mechanically fastening system in terms of how to uh, combine together cross-laminated timber and concrete so that it works together as one structural material, concrete in compression, timber in tension, so that we could have greater spans, uh, better deflection and vibration control and acoustic control. A roof panel being set in place. And then we looked at the structural system for this, the long span in the central space. And this was an opportunity for us to really look at the expressive potential of mass timber. It started out going back and forth between the engineer and the architect, in between structural efficiency and architectural form, which was the right balance of the two. Looking at that more specifically, looking at the geometries of the 
the extreme angles and seeing what type of connections could work for both of those cases. Looking at what was out there in terms of customization versus off-the-shelf product, this was a state project, uh, low bid process. So uh, we didn't have a large budget in this project, but we wanted to do something special. So off-the-shelf products such as the Specista tension rod connectors were used. Uh, the, the people in control of the budget were looking at using that for everything. As a series of these studies show, we, we used it where it made sense. We didn't, and we pushed back hard for a custom casting where it was better aesthetically. And we, when we did that, and we optimized that by using that same casting 56 times for one mold, the cost of one mold. And we used parametric definition. I think that you guys would be surprised to find this because this is not what you think of as a parametrically derived form, right? But we just used it in a way it made sense. As we were looking at the zipper truss, we knew, we didn't know going hand where the working points would be, how thick these members would be in terms of their diameters. So we just set it up in a way that it could be easily manipulated so that in our conversations with equilibrium, as the diameters change, as the working points changed, all of that could be done instantly working together, clicking a, n a number on a computer keypad and looking instantly at what that would look like instead of taking weeks to go back and forth. So we modeled this all in Rhinoceros and then put it into Revit to produce the construction documents. And we had control, allowed us to control every single parameter of this project, of this feature of the building. Particularly all the details and the connection. Again, going back to the fact that it was a low bid. And if you don't have these details, then you're at the mercy of the suppliers in terms of what they think that detail is. We didn't have any excuse in this case here, exactly as we had drawn it and envisioned. So that all comes together in the central space. Uh, created for the gathering, this is the heart of the building in which you can be seen by everybody and you can see everybody working down at the labs, the classrooms and the conference rooms, studios above. And have a chance for students to sit nearby and study, relax, be a teaching moment for uh, students of construction and technology in terms of how the pieces come together, the different structural conditions, and how the trust supports a fairly heavily loaded space above with areas up to 18 inches of soil. And it's a courtyard enclosed, and this is in New England, so you get drafts of snow. And so I think the last summer it was about 12 feet of snow on one side, drafted and uh, uh, blown all to one corner. And that same courtyard, about a year later, in terms of anticipating the growth and the changing nature of the landscape on it. Use in evenings for social events, the main studio, we envisioned it as a light, daylit fill space, uh, conducive to a pleasant uh, environment. Uh, we knew that the warmth of the wood and the tactility, the touch, would be a pleasant experience, but we didn't anticipate what the students came back and told us it was one of the most interesting features of this place, is that it smelled fresh. It smelled like a forest because of the pine. So something you learn every day in terms of what you don't realize as architects. That same structure can hold fairly intensive industrial uh, uses of research supporting cranes. This is at Peggy Clouston's lab. She was one of the advocates of mass timber in, in which uh, we needed that push from the client's end, looking, working and testing a timber truss structure, looking right into the central space. And she says it's great because when she sits at her desk and looks out, she can see through the courtyard and through the skylight and see somebody up on the uh, roof garden above her office, conference rooms, ability to shape different types of spaces. So we come to a point here in 21st century, the last 15 years or so, in terms of advancements of timber and solid construction, and I think last uh, night you were here and Andrew gave a great talk in terms of his work over the past 15 years in this. We have post and beam, which is centuries old, going back to solid heavy timber, going back hundreds, even a thousand years. And the last century, the stick frame, which really built our suburban housing areas. And you see this when you go to your parents' homes in the areas that they live, right? And this condition that is prevalent across our country today. The banality of suburbia, really the, the void of design, I would say. And we missed that mark with light timber. 
And now we're at this precipice where we're looking at heavy timber, engineer products. This is cross-laminated timber structure being built. And that's the result. This is a hotel, a housing for US Army in Alabama. This is a school in under construction in West Virginia. Again, solid cross-laminated timber construction underway. And that's what that looks like today. So with all these advancements in timber technologies and, and the great innovation that's happening, along at the same time, we have this happening as well. So what can inspire us as architects? I think there's a lot, right? We go back to beautiful examples of wood architecture. Hijemi Castle in Japan. This is Heinsa in South Korea, where the earliest uh, Buddhist scriptures made up of wood blocks were preserved for over a thousand years. And was naturally vented, protected. It's been working without any modern technology. Even in our recent history in the United States, the arts and crafts movement, Green and Green's Gamble House, the beauty of the details, meticulous thought of connections of craft. Essentially, this building is essentially furniture as architecture. Every single piece is that quality. Even in Life Frame, there's beautiful examples. Faye Jones Thorncraft Chapel, in which the material seems to dematerialize, given how thin and light it is. The biggest piece is a 2 by 10 or 2 by 8 combined together to make the four co uh, corner columns. And we see that continuation today in innovative architects, Ken Kuma being one, leading the charge, looking at Japanese historic uh, tech technologies and tectonics of joinery, and re-envisioning that in today's architecture. And the work of Shigeru Ruban and his longtime collaborator, Herman Bloomer. This is his golf clubhouse in Korea, a soaring space recalling the sensibility and the feel of old Gothic structures, these vaulted ceilings, but in wood using all of the aspects and the advantages of prefabrication and speed of construction in terms of how that's made, transported on site, and just essentially snapped together. Another collaboration between the two of them, the Temeria office building in Switzerland, really taking the extreme of wood construction, eliminating steel from all con connectors, so that that connection between the soft wood uh, timber members and the hardwood, the denser, stronger use, wood used for the connections where there's greater force is required. It's a beautiful moment, but also, again, no steel involved. So it is possible. We can push the boundaries of wood in many directions. The Elephant House in Zoo Zurich, one of the more inventive uses of cross-laminated timber, a flat panel being used to create a complex geometry of curved shapes. So we took these inspiration on our second project, which I'll lightly touch upon at University of Arkansas. This is a new student housing. And we looked to combine architecture and landscape architecture and to fuse it together sort of as a housing within the woods, within the forest. We worked together with our collaborators, Moda Studio with Arkansas, Mackie Mitchell out of St. Louis for their housing expertise and with Olin Partnership for landscape design. And we envisioned a place where the building and landscape could merge together, that regardless of where you were in the interior or the exterior, that you would see the presence of structural timber as well as timber and finish. And I was just there two weeks ago, and it's under construction. Again, using a hybrid material of using materials for their best purposes where it makes sense. Again, in the bridges of transfer beams and cantilevers, steel, the superstructure above that in wood. And as I was seeing these timber columns go up, three-story timber columns being delivered and shipped from uh, Austria, uh, from uh, Binderholz, I was reminded of our inspiration again, going back to the forest and the woods, and how those have served us well. Impossibly thin timber trunks supporting a monastery over a thousand years, 
in that tongue, China. And just even the basic vernacular architecture of how honestly what can be used to shape our everyday buildings. This is a community meeting house in Korea. And I was taken back again then to my uh, recent trip. My kids are at an age where we're hitting the national parks, one of the treasures of our, of our country system. And we were at Sequoia National Park. This is the largest living organism in the world. And it aspires, and I was thinking, we have a lot in common with the trees. I think people will talk about biophilia later on in the afternoon sessions. But I think what they naturally aspire to, we aspire to cognitively, uh, intentionally. But with all those aspirations and the technolo technological advancements, I think we also have to think about what is it about wood and its inherent characteristics that inspire us, that can shape and uh, create the feel and the experience of the temp buildings that we design. This is a Korean furniture museum in South Korea. This was a former residence of the, one of the concubines of the last king of the Korean Joseon dynasty before the Japanese occupation in 1905. And as we were approaching the gate into that complex, we were met through a door panel and a 150-year-old pine board still seeping sap all these years. And I was reminded, it's still telling us its origins of where it came from. And is it weeping because it's out of joy, or is it weeping out of sadness? And I think that's pointing in today in terms of the context of where we're at. We're at a precipice in architecture and timber technologies where it can become, the mass timber can become like the light framing in terms of the suburbia and the environments that has been created, devoid of design, sterile environments. At the other hand, there's wealth of potential in the innovations of leading architects to use this technology to take wood into places where it hasn't been done before, but also, unlike environments that are sterile and devoid, use the inher inherent intrinsic properties of wood to create the welcoming, inspiring spaces that has potential to do. So thank you for uh, your attention. There will be definitely a time for question and answer, but we want to have the presentations first, and then uh, the panelists, to be able to uh, set the stage. Because the second presenter today is uh, Michelle Roloffs, a senior structural engineer in the New York office of Arup, a global pioneer and leader in structural and building innovation. Since serving as the project manager uh, for the 475 West 18th Street project, the U.S. Tall Wood Building Competition winner for the East Coast Design with Shop, Michelle has continued to pursue the possibilities of timber as a building material and is a sought-after contributor to the important discourse between architecture and structures in unlocking the potential of mass timber. I think this is a really appropriate follow-up to uh, Tom's presentation to be able to really examine from a structural, examine, uh, structural standpoint how to think about the opportunities of mass timber. So will you please welcome Michelle. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. I am going to talk through some opportunities and challenges and then maybe touch on some ways that we can thank you, get through some of these challenges as designers. Um, so I am a structural engineer at Arup. Um, I don't work exclusively on timber projects, but I, I am a timber enthusiast, and there are more than it's more than just me at Arup. We're a multidisciplinary firm. We have this like very cool club that we call the Timberistas um, that <laughs> I'm a part of, um, and there are quite uh, and there's a, a wide range of, of um, engineering disciplines that are involved with this. So there are a lot of structural engineers, um, sustainability consultants, fire consultants. I, I think a lot of people here know Dave Barber, who's really well um, involved in the community of timber, and then also acoustics. So I'm I'm going to touch on so on. Uh, many of these aspects as I as I go through my again my backgrounds structural but uh, timber more so than more conventional materials is uh, much more multidisciplinary than um, than steel or concrete so just to 
I, I think Tom already gave a really good overview, but just to make sure we're all talking about the same thing, um, you know, what, what is mass timber? And I want to clarify that we're not talking about light frame, which has been around for centuries now. Um, all, it is a perfectly valid form of construction, but as we're talking about mass timber, we really are talking about elements that are of a, of a, a larger um, dimension. So light frame being think two by construction, um, mass timber, depending on the element, is typically a minimum um, four to six inches of dimension. And I also want to clarify that you know a lot of the discussion around mass timber has been specific around cross-laminated timber, but there really are a lot of different products out there that are all part of the mass timber suite, and they are all can um, be valid on a, on a mass timber project. All right, so if we try to talk about opportunities and challenges, you start with your very uh, basic pro con list and try to put things in you know opportunities or challenges and it's actually pretty difficult to to classify them in one or the other um, it's much more of a continuum where you're where there are things that are weighted a little more opportunity a little bit more challenge and there are a lot of things that you can depending on the decisions you make it's either an opportunity or or a challenge so there's a lot of different things on here there are some things that are kind of squarely opportunities that are really good um, a really good sustainability story, the speed of construction, the, the digital capabilities and CNC capabilities. There are some things in the middle that are a little bit, uh, you know, durability, acoustics, there are really good ways to detail timber to deal with this, but you can create a challenge for yourself if you don't think about that in um, kind of early stages of design and make sure that you're, you're tackling the importance of, of those products. And then there are, there are things that are currently still a bit of a challenge. A lot of the public perception around the risks of, of um, mass timber and fire and, and um, issues related to our codes and standards. So I'm just going to kind of pick one from each of those, each of those categories and, and walk through. So starting, um, I think sustainability is a good way to, to kick off, to remind ourselves what we're, why we are really interested in this product. And um, we can talk through Connections is an example of a structural challenge. And then uh, approvals, I'm sp specifically talking about uh, the approvals of an authority having jurisdiction. So sustainability. Um, we've talked a little bit, you know, in the, in the discussion around sustainability in the built environment, there's been a lot of emphasis on uh, operational carbon. So a lot of, uh, many of the of LEED and other uh, industry standards are trying to reduce the amount of operational carbon in, a, in the building. And that's great and it's really, uh, some place where we can have a lot of impact as designers, but um, per, as a structural engineer, I actually don't have a lot of control over that. So I'm a little bit more interested in the embodied carbon. Um, and there, you know, now that we are really getting our an, a good understanding of operational carbon, we can look at at embodied. And if you look at a typical building, uh, you know, it's the most of the embodied carbon is coming from the superstructure, the substructure, uh, and you know, cladding and services and uh, and all of that within within your building. So if you isolate this, you can see that there are three main components where that you could really use timber. Uh, that's in your superstructure. Uh, as Tom mentioned, you really don't want timber in your substructure, so we can leave that as, as concrete for now. Um, uh, and then you have your cladding and finishes where you have opportunities. So that's almost 70% of your embodied carbon can be affected by the use of, of switching to a different material. Um, and it's important when you're thinking about this embodied carbon number that there's really, it comes from a lot of different places, from where, how you extract the material, how you manufacture it, the process of constructing, and then importantly, what happens when your building life is over and you are, are um, disposing of, of, the, uh, of the material. So this is kind of a typical timber life cycle. Um, there's a little bit of, of carbon of, of energy that's used in planting, then you have this kind of big drop, which is the carbon sequestration that happens over the kind of 30 to 100 year of, a, of growth. Um, you again use some energy as you manufacture it. It sits stable in the building for the course of its life. And then there's a decision point at the end of life. And you know, I think when we're designing, we, we don't think as much about the end of life, but um, it's something that's good to keep in mind and also as you know, many of our projects, you are tearing something down to put up your new project. So this is something as, that, you know, we, we can s still make good decisions um, at end of life. So uh, uh, 
in my intro, we uh, talked about the 475 West 18th project with SHOP, which unfortunately is not moving forward, but we've been able to learn a lot from this project. And uh, this, so this was intended to be a 10-story high-end residential building in Chelsea uh, with CLT shear walls, glue lamp beams and columns, CLT floor plates, and, and that all sitting on a concrete substructure. And one thing uh, we, we wanted to do with this is to see how this would stack up against a conventionally built uh, product. So we compared it to flat plate construction, uh, concrete construction, which is what you would typically find for this type of condo building. Um, so we looked at concrete flat slab. We did change up the column grid to be more appropriate for, you know, for concrete to do a like for like comparison. And you know you plug in all your numbers into your life cycle analysis machine, and you get, and you get this. So okay, uh, concrete is the dashed line on top, timber the solid line on the bottom. Seems like a pretty pretty obvious that that timber is better, and you could you could just leave from there. But then, you know, you, there's a lot of assumptions that you are putting into these life cycle analysis um, calculations that you're doing, and if you just change around some of those assumptions, you can make timber. Uh, you can make timber worse, uh, a, a less sustainable option than concrete, depending on how you, um, uh, depending on so a lot of the decisions that are made in the, in the design and manufacturing process. So probably most important is that the timber needs to be harvested from a sustainably managed forest. So you, you are really not gaining any of the carbon sequestration benefits if you are not sourcing from a, a sustainably managed forest. And that's kind of the biggest um, one of the biggest decisions that, that needs to be made when you're sourcing the material. Um, there's also uh, just a thought of where you're sourcing your material from. Uh, at the moment, a lot of, there's not as much mass timber or at least CLT manufacturing in, um, in the Northeast, and so most is being trucked in or shipped in. So there is a bit of an uptick there in your carbon use. Um, hopefully as the as the industry grows, people can source more locally and, and reduce these transportation costs and um, kind of environmental costs. And then again, back at, at end of life, um, the, this is a, an example where you, both of these are going to landfill, but one, in one uh, uh, example you're capturing the methane, which um, release, does not release the greenhouse gases into the environment. So. There's some, so the, the main takeaway is, is that the, you really need to think about how you're sourcing your material, where, um, where you're sourcing from at, uh, in terms of distance, and then how that is eventually being um, disposed of at, at, at the end of life. And some, just a plug for some um, in, more information about sustainably managed forests. There are some good studies out there currently. This is an EcoTrust study that compares um, FSC certified forests to kind of business as usual forests. And it, I should say, not there are forests out there that are not certified that still behave, you know, for use sustainable practices. Um, but in this study, comparing the two, you tend to be, by going FSC certified, you have around 25 to 80% um, more carbon sequestration in, in the process. But all that to say, you have a little bit more comfort that if you go with FSC that you you have a sustainably managed product um, otherwise you might want to do a bit of research into the where you're sourcing from so connections this is one where there's a, a lot of really beautiful opportunities with connections Tom had some really wonderful examples of connections uh, that can be inspirational architecturally there you know many connections are a combination of steel and timber that um, that are exposed. There are some kind of timber to timber joints that can either be doweled, uh, like the Shigeru Bond example. Uh, also, you can finger joint and glue, but that is needs to be done in a factory. So it does at some point you'll have to connect it um, in field once you get inside. Um, but as the one, one of the challenges with a lot of these exposed connections is that you know, tr many of these that you see are connections at, at roofs or places where you don't need a fire rating. And you don't, now that we're looking at products that, or buildings that where we really want to be taller, um, change the occupancy, we, we need to be getting one to up to three hour fire ratings from some of these connections. And you, you, 
can't really get that from an exposed steel connection the way that, it, that a lot of these are. So, um, and another important point about timber connections in general is that they are a weak point of the structure, and this is just a, a little bit of a warning out there that in a conventional material, you normally would size your, your beam, and then you, you know, for steel, often the, the contractor fabric or designs the connection, it's, it's an afterthought. For timber, you really want to design your connection first. It's going to drive your whole design, and if you wait till the end, you will not be happy with how much bigger your connections get. So if you look at one of these connections, this is a, a, a little image from, from shop of a typical joint of glue lamb beam column with a CLT slab. Um, this is you know, in a condition where you do need a fire rating. You're, you have your, your fire um, in, that, in that area and a little primer on, on timber, mass timber and fire. It's similar to throwing a, a log on a fire. You get a char layer around the perimeter. Um, that acts as a layer of insulation, you have wood um, in the center that has not lost any of its mechanical properties and can still carry load, but you are essentially working with a reduced cross section. So uh, as a rule of thumb, it chars at about an inch and a half an hour, so if you needed a two hour fire rating, you might need to upsize your beams approximately three inches you know, around the perimeter, so six inches overall. It can be a big um, increase in your, in your element size. So um, if we look back at this connection, you have your fire, chars up or around, and then you have that little zone in the middle, which is where you can put your connection, essentially. It, it's acting as your fire protection for your connection. There are a lot of concealed connections out there. Um, you can, like very standard little T brackets for smaller beams, maybe in aluminum. You can also do it in steel, um, concealed, concealed hangers. And then there are these proprietary connections out there, which are pretty common in, in Europe. Um, they are starting to test them here in the US. So MightyCon is one of the manufacturers that is kind of making a push in, in the US. But they, you, you basically use these high capacity long screws to screw into your timber. So when you come out on site, you're really just kind of clipping together, almost more like an erector set or something. Um, so it's a really clever system. Um, and now they are starting to test these to up to two-hour ratings. Um, but you can, you can base this illustrates it pretty well that you can see the, that char is going right up to where the connection is, and that's how you've achieved the fire rating. Um, also, so you can also come up with all sorts of connections. There's guidance for fire design and timber um, in TR10, part of the uh, National Design Specification. And this, um, you can either follow the prescriptive code requirements, but also if you have a project where you're going to have a lot of repeating connections, it, it is probably worth getting it tested so that you can kind of slim down your, um, your connections. And you can do a, a test like this and, and prove out your, your capacity. But you really do have this opportunity to, with timber connections and that once you have these concealed connections, it's really beautiful, um, you know, seamless looking construction. So like, the, in, you know, basically to get your fire protection, you need to conceal and have this, this beautiful joint compared to kind of covering or, uh, you know, spray applied fireproofing and steel. And then approvals. So this is the, this is my favorite. Um, <laughs> so, um, this is kind of an ever-changing landscape, um, and the, the most important question with approvals is, you know, where is your project? So you kind of start from basics. Where, where are you um, trying to build? Because it is different in every single jurisdiction, so you have to treat, it, treat them all differently. So assuming we are in New York, because um, we are, then even here, that's not like a very straightforward answer. So are you on, at the Department of Buildings, which is you know, a, a New York, the New York City DOB? Are you NYC Parks, which actually is self-certifying and they follow New York State? Um, uh, you know, are you at Port Authority? Like there's a lot of different jurisdictions even just within New York City. And it's, it's significant because New York City is still working off of IBC 2012. Um, whereas New York State is working off of IBC 2015. And sp specific to Mass Timber, um, 2012 has no mention of CLT in it, where 2015 does. So there's kind of this 
uh, if you're planning to use cross laminated timber on a project and you're in a jurisdiction that's still on 2012, it's just, it's not that you can't do it, but it's not going to be as of right. And so now you're, you at least know, you know, where you are. Um, then the next question is what is your building type and, and does it meet a current as of right building typology um, under, under your code? And th this doesn't actually matter if you're in 2012 or 2015. Heavy timber, that definition hasn't changed. So there are, um, if you can go up to six stories, some jurisdictions it's maybe you can get another story if you have a concrete podium. There's, you know, there's, there's all sorts of little loopholes in there, but but essentially, are you kind of below six stories? Um, and in which case, you may have an as of right type four heavy timber building. If you don't, so let's say you're going taller than that, um, then there's this process. So you have an initial meeting with the building department. Um, you probably also want to get the fire department involved early on in a new jurisdiction. Um, you go through this level of you know education, negotiation, putting, um, you know, Oh, I'll add more sprinklers, or I'll do, you know, um, give an additional hour of fire rating on, on different elements. There's all sorts of things that can happen in this little cycle, and that is a cycle you can get caught in. Um, and you may, you know, the answer may be no at, at the end. If you have an as of right building, you get to skip all of that and just get your permit. So there's a lot of value in um, um, trying to stick to the, the code requirements. And so and this is where I'm going to make a push for code compliant buildings because I think particularly on the East Coast and in New York City, we actually don't have a lot of buildings that have really taken advantage of like what is possible within the six story limit. You know, we don't have a lot of exposed beautiful timber buildings um, in the city at all. There are some examples. Um, most of them are, you know, more than 100 years old. So there are a lot of warehouse buildings that were built using mass timber construction. I mean, it is, these are kind of big sawn lumber pieces of beams and columns with, you know, light frame, um, light frame fours. So it's not exactly what we're kind of working with today, but it, it, you can see this is a restoration of an old uh, warehouse building by S9 Architecture that you, you can see how beautiful of an office space and how pleasant it would be to work in a space like that. And that's something that can be replicated now. And this, this type of building doesn't, it, it's, it's code compliant. So you can build something like this now. Um, there's a lot of examples of this across the country. So in Minneapolis, they have Butler Square, which is this really impressive space uh, that was, has been restored recently. Um, and then one of the earliest examples of mass timber in the, at this scale in this country was the T3 Minneapolis building, which really drew some inspiration from, from the historic buildings that they had in that space. But I mean, it basically took 100 years to come back to a similar, uh, a similar typology, although there is a, mu a much improved system uh, with the floors. There's, I think, a lot of opportunity just in offices in general. There are a lot of examples of offices in Europe and in the UK where they're really taking advantage of exposing all of this timber. If you go over to the West Coast, there are so many examples of buildings in this kind of five to six story range that we, we just don't have here either you know, as examples. Um, education, uh, Tom presented some really beautiful education projects. And there's you know, small gymnasiums. There's all sorts of things that you can do with, with mass timber and that. And then uh, even aviation, there's a, there are some examples of small airports that have some really beautiful mass timber roofs. And you know, really, there's, there's all sorts of opportunities out there. And I think if we can think of these smaller buildings um, and try to find good design opportunities for timber, that will really help advance. So uh, you know, I think. Although tall, tall timber is very exciting, and I do think we're going to get there. To get there on the East Coast, I really think we need more examples that people can like live in and see and work in, and and so everybody can understand the value of of using timber in, um, you know, commercial and residential spaces. But all that to say, looking forward, there are some advances in the tall timber world. Um, so, uh, for those that aren't familiar, there is. There has been um, the, the IBC that has 
had put together a, an ad hoc working group for Tall Timber, which has been deliberating for the last couple of years. They commissioned a really big fire study, um, which is available online either at buildtallbuildsafe.com, which is just easy to remember, but you can also just look up the, the uh, IBC ad hoc Tall Timber Committee and find all of these reports, all these reports online. But basically, they have um, come up with three new building types that are in addition to the traditional type four heavy timber building. So um, right now, this has been voted out of committee, so it's passed its kind of first big hurdle. And then in October, end of October, so end of this month, I guess, it will be um, up for the the open vote, which is not exact. It's I think they call it the public vote, but general public can't really vote on it. It's just code officials, but it is an an, a, an open voting period. And then by December, we will know whether um, the, this language is going to make it into the 2021 IBC. So just to kind of think about that, we have these new building types. They might be they might make it into the 2021 IBC. And then that doesn't really mean anything until that is adopted by jurisdictions, right? And it's 2018 now, and we are still using the 2012 IBC in New York City. So you can still imagine that it's going to, like, it might be 2030 before this language kind of makes its way into New York City. So this is a, this is a, a really great step, but I think it's, this isn't happening tomorrow that it's going to um, be on our on our doorsteps. And just to talk through a little bit what they are. So type four is what we already have, um, which is the five stories, which is, it's all, it's five stories up to 85 feet. And those are, that's some pretty generous stories. And so um, they've come up with this type four C, which basically keeps the same height, but allows you to slot in a lot more stories. So you can go up to nine stories. Um, this is, you know, appropriate for residential, residential buildings. Uh, could also work for office. And in here, you can have all of your timber exposed except for your cores. That will, those would need to be encapsulated with, with gypsum or be of a different material, a non-combustible material, and it needs to receive two, two hours. Um, all of the new building types are sprinklered, so that is a, a requirement for all of them. Type 4B is um, you can go up to 12 stories. Again, your cores need to be protected, and then there are limits, which uh, you can read more about, but it, there are limits on how much you can actually have exposed. So that may mean you can only have your ceiling exposed, or you can have parts of one wall exposed, and so you need to kind of pick and choose where you really want your, your timber to be exposed. And then there's the um, type 4A, which is the tallest in the category. That goes up to 18 stories, but that is with um, non-combustible cores, so you're steel or concrete cores, and then um, nothing can be exposed. So this is really modeled after the Brock Commons project in, in British Columbia, which is fully encapsulated. Um, and that would need to re also achieve a, a three hour fire rating, which you would get by your, your gypsum. So kind of going back to this diagram and that cycle, one thing that all of this language is going to do for us soon is that it is going to be a lot easier to go into these um, negotiations with your building department if you have IBC approved code language in hand. So you can say, I, you know, I'm trying to, I, I want to build this building. It meets all the requirements of the like, you know, 2021 IBC language that's been approved. And that's something that's going to be a, a much more convincing argument once you're, you're with your building department. So if you are looking to, to push past um, the current code prescribed limits, I would recommend seeing if you can at least fit into one of those three categories because um, that, that should make the process easier. Um, so we, we made it through these three. Um, there's a lot of other things to talk about, which hopefully we can uh, maybe touch on in the panel discussion. Uh, but that is all I have for you now. Thank you. But I just wanted to thank you for these uh, very informative and, and inspiring presentations. Um, I was taught not to um, begin, you know, present, presenting in the negative. Like, what are you not? What what are you what are you not going to do? But so because that advice has been given to me many times in the past, I'm actually going to defy it 
<laughs> and, and tell you some of the questions I am not going to ask. <laughs> so one question is, how do we convince authorities to let us design, engineer, and build in mass timber? How do we convince people about the safety of mass timber? And when can we expect to be able to build large, more dense timber buildings in a place like New York City? I'm going to pause it for the moment because we have these discussions when we get together socially, us architects, about things like mass timber and the ultimate um, result that happens in our cities, especially in our cities. Um, I'm also going to defy the, the title of this, which is Timber Today, and I'm going to imagine and posit that we're in the future, that today is actually the future, where those questions have been answered. We can build more densely out of timber. We can build a little bit taller, if not super tall. Um, we don't need to discuss the inherent qualities of this material. It's been played out last night and today that smart forestry, sustainable use of these materials is responsible. It is better for our, our climate. It is better for our health. It is better for our cities. So those are the things we're going to imagine that we can do this all now. So David and I were talking last week about what this means for our cities. Let's say we are building this way. Let's say we can do all this. So my questions center around a comment that, that Andrew Waugh had last night. A developer spoke to him and, and said that, I think that if I misquote this, Andrew can correct me, but that the goal for this developer was to v build to a sufficiently mundane standard. So presuming we can do this and presuming that we are not simply replacing concrete blocks and concrete planks, which is the language of the structure and the skeleton of the architecture that, that I have to make in social housing. Suppose we remove that language and we replace it with this language, and that's happening now because that's my fiction. What is the formal implication for our city? Like, Where does the invention come from in this material? Is it just the banality of suburbia that Tom showed in his presentation? Is it just now a banality of the urban? And all those beautiful connections that are seen in, in your wonderful building at UMass and the beautiful connections that you've described and the technical precision with which these are made, if those are all cloaked and hidden, what is the formal future of our cities when this is all adopted? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so let's put ourselves like five years ahead, let's say, right? Um, <laughs> I think with mass timber, especially uh, cross laminated timber, which has potential to span in two directions, and not just, we're showing flat plates right now in terms of its application, <laughs> but I, I, there's a, a rich potential there just in terms of a solid construction that can shape spaces, whether it's diagonal, triangular. You could think of, of a lot of the, uh, you know, <laughs> you could even think of something like the Louvre, right? right? And, and that form could be done in a, a mass timber, cross laminated timber because of its capabilities, hide all the connections. So, so I think we don't have to resign ourselves to the fact that we could, we're going to just have rectangular boxes uh, extruded up because that's what the, in five years the code is going to allow us to do. And even without exposing the connectors, because it is a very plastic material in that sense, this can be done. So if the material is approved and the connections are approved in, in a sense that it's hidden and protected, then I think there's a wealth of possibilities. Uh, there's, al there's already a manufacturer making curved CLT, right? And, and you could make all of the hidden connections work with that as well. Um, the smile building that I think uh, that uh, uh, Alison Brooks, that uh, Michelle showed in her introductory slide, is a very inventive use of cross laminated timber in a form, ex unexposed timber, I mean, uh, unexposed uh, connections. And so it's already happening, I would say. So I think we just have to think uh, more creatively uh, along those lines. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the uh, capabilities of CNC allow for more interesting shapes of architecture than um, 
you know, than, than a lot of conventional material. It may not be more that much more expensive to, to build with more interesting shapes. But I, I, about this whole question of the banality of suburbia, I'm, I'm not sure that we can rely on timber to kind of solve that problem. I think it's going to persist just, it, it's, you know, it's above the, the material that's chosen. And we may, you know, still want to encourage that type of construction because if, uh, if some of these, you know, a CVS is going to get built either way, right? But if they build it out of CLT, then that is building the market and allowing more opportunity for more interesting projects. So I, I think, you know, I don't think we're, we're going to get to a point where every, every yeah. you know, McDonald's is beautiful. I was actually kind of, <laughs> yeah. Well, I was, well, there is a I, CLT yeah. McDonald's being yeah. built in Chicago yeah, right yeah, now. That's right. So <laughs> actually, <laughs> yeah, that was kind of like a pro provocative statement that I was making. Yeah. I, I know probably the cars are, are stacked not in our favor because of the commoditization of this material. But as you say, the McDonald's example, perfect example, right? There's so many... If you think of McDonald's, the hundreds of McDonald's throughout the country and the world, right? And you have an image that comes to mind. But with that CLT McDonald's, it's a very different McDonald's, right? And just because of using a, a different medium as a structure that can be exposed in its own inherent qualities, I think that had a lot to do with that McDonald's being quite different than all the other ones. And if we could make a dent in something as banal as McDonald's and change that look, then I think the possibility is there for people who dare to, to take on that challenge. Mm -hmm. One uh, follow-up, and I think this has to do a little bit with um, new, both the newness and the oldness of things in a way, right? So it's, what I think is nice about this discussion is that, or this panel, is that we have an engineer and we have an architect. And I think about um, my own education in learning about timber having started this just a few years ago, um, kind of being thrown into the mix on, on, on this project at inception is the confluence of the disciplines, right? So if we, again, posit that times have changed, that we are now allowed to do all these things, how much does the profession of architecture need to be either educated or re-educated with a building like this? In your own experience, Tom, in building this way, and maybe, Michelle, your experience in working with architects who are probably coming back or freshly to this type of construction? What do you see the kind of speed, the rapidity with which we can all learn these methods, again, as they become much more common? I mean, in my experience, I think that it's, um, you know, there is certainly a learning curve to, to timber, but it doesn't, it's not that, you know, one project and you've got a lot of the, the things that you need to watch out for. Um, you know, under your belt. So I, I think there's a lot of, there's some fear out there of just trying a new material and not really knowing what, um, you know, what, what the options are, uh, what the options are and what you need to watch out for. But I, I really think that if everyone just kind of steps out a little bit, uh, it's a little, it's, it's a little, there, there's maybe two paths. One here is just people taking the risk and, and looking at a new material on their own. I think the other path, and this is maybe appropriate for where we are right now, is in um, is in education, and I, I, it's, I think, pretty inconsistent in how um, timber is taught in different universities. Certainly, I can't speak as much to architecture school, but I, you know, there was one timber class in my kind of engine, engineering um, education, which was optional. I took it, but you know, I would say most people did not. So it's, um, I think it's something that we we should really be pushing to get into our curriculum. Yeah, so in my experience, I think. Um there are, I think, two conditions fundamentally in terms of the interaction between the architect and the engineer. And it comes down to essentially the type of connections. So the design building, we, I spoke at length about the exposed connections, but there, that's the central space. All the perimeter spaces are hidden connections. You've got columns and beams coming together with a proprietary hidden connection. So as Michelle said, there's a lot of products that are tested, all uh, engineered, calculated, all of those things that are ready at our disposal. And so in those cases, uh, you, know, you, you shape the spaces and, and you, you talk about the member sizes with your engineers, and you don't worry necessarily so much about that. At least in my case, that wasn't the case. Uh, but it, in terms of a feature space where connections become both architecture and structural, that's where uh, you really need an intense collaboration between the architect and the structural engineer. And 
as an architect, you sort of have to put on the structural engineer's hat in a sense that you need to be familiar with sort of the basic principles of structure, of where the load paths are, things that you can visualize, so you're not proposing things that don't make sense, but also from the structural engineer, putting on a designer's hat, thinking about what is, what is the architect after here, in terms of is it, is it just the efficient connection that we're after, or is it something different? So it's really, I think, you, you have to sort of meet in the middle, and, and, and I think for me, that was like the, the most fun part of the project uh, in, in working with uh, Robert Mulchik with Equilibrium Consulting, is that we really kind of, in our own roles, took on, sort of put on the hat of the other, of our collaborator. And uh, it was probably the most amount of work that I've done with the structure engineer uh, <laughs> in a project by far. I think I, once I calculated the m number of hours and it was like eight times a typical uh, structure engineering coordination that I did on a project, and like maybe a third of that was billable, you know? <laughs> so it was a learning research, right? You, you put it under professional development. But um, yeah, so it's, I, I think there's both conditions there. And I guess one, one little plug to make for, um, there's a lot of organizations out there that are really willing to give a lot of help and free advice to designers who are interested in, in working with mass timber. So. Um, Woodworks is a really great resource out there, and there's, you can contact them, and they will really give you uh, as much or as little support as you need. And um, I, I think that is is probably an, it's enough to kind of get people that are uncomfortable with a material caught up to speed relatively quickly. So I would leverage all of that free support. Okay, so we have again. This is my own fantasy, my my own future. I apologize for telling everyone this. Um, we have adopted the code. We, we can build these things. We have better educated architects because their schooling tells them how to build these things. We have um, collaborative, thoughtful architects who are eager to work with their engineers to make these buildings. Um, so some very specific questions. I'll, I'll put them all out there, and then you can answer them as you, as you see fit. What do our cities look like, and are they any different? <laughs> Most importantly, what happens to our labor force? How are our buildings made? And how does the building industry respond to this new way of making things? So maybe you start with the second part of that question, the labor force. Um, because it, I think inherently uh, with mass timber, it's a um, pre-construction process in that it's being fabricated in the shop. Everything's designed in terms of all the connections, modeled, uh, the architect and the engineer. You've got a very sophisticated model along with the supplier in terms of everything's worked out before you press the button on that CNC machine, right? So, and, and the advantage of that is that machines are doing the things that machines should do, that humans shouldn't do because it's much more efficient. And that's all going the good way, right? And, and so this has revolutionized you know, the phones that we use, the, you know, the supply chain, the economy of scale. And, it, and I think uh, if you know the work of Katera, what they're doing, that's what they're trying to do. Uh, and it's affected every industry except the building industry, which is sort of like we still do buildings the way we've done 100 years ago, right? It hasn't changed much. But because of the digital fabrication, all the things coming into play, that, that has a, a huge effect. So what that means for the, the labor force is that, yes, there's going to be less people needed in the, in the field, but there's going to be more jobs requiring a better paying job, better education, a value that you bring instead of, you know, like the, I always go back, when you think of construction, there's that scene in the movie Good Will Hunting, you know that, right? Where Ben Affleck is talking with uh, Matt Damon's character, and he goes, you know, if, if if I see you back here in like two years and I'm still picking you up at your house because they're going off to do demolition, right? I'm gonna like fucking kill you, right? That's what he says, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Because of the potential. So, and, and that's sort of stuck to me because it has the way, it has the potential to change construction, not as kind of like the lowest common denominator in terms of what you do because you can't do anything else, but a highly pr uh, productive value proposition. So it will affect, ex and I think that's not just for the construction industry. It's already happening everywhere else. So I think we just have to know, realize that it's going that direction and start educating our, our people that are in, interested in the construction industry to do that. 
um, in terms of how the the future city is going to look like. <laughs> um, I don't. Yeah. Well, you think about the city and when it was done in masonry and heavy timber in the 1800s to the turn of the century when it was steel, and then now when it's concrete. And you look at the New York City, and you can see the changing scale of of, of buildings, right? And so uh, I think the, the scale is one thing, and sure, the, I, the timber can do that, but I think, and maybe Michelle knows this, can re respond to this better, there is a certain limit to what wood can do, mm -hmm. right? It is a weaker material. And so although we're pushing at this, and people have theorized 40, 50 story buildings, and yes, it can be engineered, it can be done, hasn't been proven yet, uh, at, that, at that height, you know, does it make sense to do this in wood when you really, sh when it can be done more efficiently and economically in steel and concrete? And, and so if that means what is the sweet spot, which I think if you talk to most engineers, it's the six to 12 story, which if you look at all the kind of the cities in the world, that's, that's that range. And so uh, an architect, Alan Organsky, is really probably the leading proponent of this, that he's really looked at that scale in terms of how this can change cities. And, and, and so far, it's, it's in terms of the, the, the bigger question of how does this affect the, uh, the world environment and the global warming. And in terms of the look and the feel, I think that goes back to the sort of the first question of, of, of that I answered in terms that uh, it's not limited to the, the slabs, right? It, it, you, can, you can do other forms because of the nature of the material. I think I'll, I'll tackle it in the same order. So the, the the workforce, I think, I mean, currently it's still an outstanding question of who is going to be the, who are the, the installers of, of mass timber elements, um, particularly in places like New York where unions are very strong. Um, and, and I think it's an opportunity for uh, some, you know, uh, current unions to kind of jump up and say that they want to take that on. So I, there's an, I know there's, a, a project going up where it was a, a concrete crew that installed it because they were doing concrete on site, so it seemed to make sense. There are carpenters that can install, but there, there's going to be this kind of new um, uh, type of construction worker that installs this type of material. It is much smaller crews, so that um, all, because so much is done on site, I think the construction ends up being significantly quieter and cleaner. You have less people on site um, at a time. Um, but you have more people in the factory that have kind of more stable and, and inside jobs that um, involve the, the use of technology to, to make this construction. Um, in terms of the, you know, what the, the city will look like, I mean, partly it'll um, be maybe slightly less visible construction. We'll see, because <laughs> it's going up faster and, and um, you know, you can get get some of uh, the get some scaffolding down a little bit sooner um, also uh, something that hasn't been talked about as much but because of the the lightweight nature of timber I think there's this whole opportunity of, of adding you know one to two stories onto a lot of the existing buildings that we have right now so you could have this changing landscape of a lot of our buildings in Brooklyn and Queens with um, just a couple more s stories added added on top so that that could be a, a, a way that it, mm -hmm. it's used I think that's a that's an answer I wasn't expecting. That is a great answer. Yeah. Um, I think it's a good time to have the audience involved um, so that we can hear other people speaking. Um, is there a microphone that has to go around? Does anyone have any questions for the panelists? Um, yes, the question. Um, could you address the question of um, the completed buildings and what happens to energy and energy use <coughs> in 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 these buildings, please, and the timber buildings. Thank you. So I can speak from my experience. So, um, with cross laminated timber buildings, and and in my building, it was just essentially if you look at the envelope, it's uh, the roof condition. The other walls were conventionally built with using metal studs and built up rain screen assembly. But um, the wood has a good insulative factor, so it reduced uh, the energy use in terms of energy escaping from the roof, given the greater R, R value there. So if, you, if you're building a kind of a, a solid building, per se, I think it has that potential to, well, it does have that potential, uh, and it's proven in other buildings where you can uh, have a greater performing uh, 
envelope assembly, which in turn means less energy use. But uh, again, buildings are complicated. It, it has to go along well with in terms of how it's designed and what kind of uh, mechanical systems you have and how sophisticated that is and, and how smart that is. So it's, you can do a cross laminated timber building and have a uh, really poor mechanical system and not do anything, right? So yeah. It's, yeah, I'd agree that the you know mechanical systems are kind of independent of the of the material, um, and it does ultimately come down to the details of how well sealed do you make your buildings. And so there's there's been a lot of work, um, kind of crossover between passive house construction and mass timber construction, and it's certainly possible to achieve passive house standards with mass timber. But really, it all comes down to the details and the quality of construction, um, which can go either way. Uh, hey, I wanted to um, ask a question about the future of timber as uh, cladding and finish, because you mentioned earlier that uh, cladding and finishes can also help with the sustainability aspect of construction and design. Uh, and I think there's this fear or this stigma about wood that it can only ever be this warm, orangey type thing. Uh, but what, I mean, I guess that's the challenge for us designers now. How does wood has no longer become wood as a structure? It's this new thing. How does the wood as an interior finish become a new thing? And if you knew anything about research into that. So as an interior material, I think there's so much, so much out there in terms of uh, different use of wood, whether in, it's a different finish, whether it's a composite material, uh, different color shapes. I, I think you can see that all around us. I think the greater challenge is in in terms of the exterior cladding, because it is a it is a material that ha w uh, reacts with moisture and sunlight, and uh, it will change if you don't do anything with it. But I think we're also well along our way in terms of the industry looking at that. So uh, even now, you know, there's there's so many options more that are more available. You know, you have charred wood, you have acoya wood. There's a lot of science in terms of actually changing the molecular. Uh, structure of wood so that it becomes less water, uh, 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 more water tolerant. Uh, and so I think w whether it's through kind of those uh, microbiological um, investigations into wood or different processes like thermal process of, 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 of treating wood, composites, mixing wood with other materials, uh, I think that will open us up in terms of our, our, our resources available as designers to to do things in wood that, that for the very you know, practical reasons of when you talk with clients and especially in the work you do in the public sector of durability, maintenance, all of these things are which are real to them uh, that, that may seem limiting as a designer, I think you're starting to find that those things, those limits are going away. So I think the future looks bright and you, you'll have an easier time being more exploratory, inventive than we are today, than we were five years ago, than 10 years ago. Yeah, the, the, the only thing I, I would add to that is that the um, there are so that believe in better office building that I showed at the at the end of my presentation is an example where they the it wasn't exposed timber cladding but the actual facade panels themselves used timber studs as their structure and the, the so it was completely concealed and you know water water tight in terms of an enclosure but what that the benefit that that gave is that it was really lightweight so they were able to fabricate the, the full height of the building, three stories, into panels that they could lift with a crane and put on a building. And that lightweight aspect of it allowed the facade to go up really quickly because you, you know, the facade can take a long time to put on a, on a building, but these were three-story panels that were just kind of plunked on. Um, so it's another opportunity of using something lightweight, even if you're not exposing it. Hi, I have a comment and a question. Um, the comment kind of relates to the conversation about employment uh, and about jobs for making uh, mass timber materials. I think I, I just wanted to <clears throat> kind of add to that that a lot of people are required to, to cut down those trees and then to work <coughs> in the sawmills. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think those are fields that have kind of reached maybe a sort of peak automation. So I think that um, just more use of wood generally might uh, kind of in increase linearly the amount of employment in those fields. Uh, my question, though, is about a little bit about this question of height. 
Um, and I think I'd like to unpack that and maybe think about it in terms of actually kind of typology. I think that's height and typology are often tied together. And I think it's interesting both of you showed some stick frame buildings and talked about them in terms of their relationship to the kind of um, North American single family home typology. And I think that that's an example of a, a material and a system being tied to a building type. I think there's other examples of that. I think um, concrete masonry units are another one of the kind of unsung heroes of North American construction, and that's tied to a certain building. And then I think we can talk about steel buildings like the home insurance building in Chicago that sort of initiated a, a typology tied to steel, the office building where we need large apertures and daylight for, for daytime activities. So I'm wondering if there's a, a building type that you think uh, mass timber and CLT is sort of best situated within. Tom, your work has largely dealt with um, institutional buildings. And then we've talked about some of the kind of higher, the West 18th Street project and the framework project in Oregon. Very different sort of building typologies. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to the f what you sort of project as the future for the, the typology tied to mass timber. Yeah, I, I think in terms of design, there's really no, I, I personally think in terms of design potential, there is no one typology that would be more uh, conducive than the other. I, I think for all those examples that you mentioned, what drove those were the economy, the factor of construction costs, right? And that's what's driving those. And so with uh, mass timber uh, elements, because it's so modular and the way it's produced, it's, it's the best way to produce that in the least cost effective way is automating that process as much as possible. And in terms of any automation, the more similar pieces that you have that you could just churn out thousands of them instead of like special four or five different pieces, that just means more efficiency and all of that comes down to the cost. So, so if you look at it from that way, and I think it's probably going to go that way, is, is my sense, uh, just looking at the economic factors, then what are the typologies that is going to be most conducive? Well, the office building type, the housing type, repetitive modular elements, those things in which those mass timber structures can, can fit in within that six to 12 story typologies and, and make that work and, and hopefully and do that in a way where it's, it's designed well, it's exposed in a way that you take advantage of the inherent quality of these materials. Um, and, and so th that would be my answer, I would say. Yeah, the, the ad additional factor in a lot of what drives these um, typologies is how far your floor can span and how many you know, columns you can accommodate in a space. So office, you know, you have your standard kind of 40 foot lease span, um, which works well for steel. And then residential is a smaller module that works well in concrete. So timber doesn't span really as far as either of those materials, um, but um, many people, at, at least from the, the buildings, particularly out in the West Coast, don't seem to mind you know, nice timber columns in their office space. So maybe you can't have a completely open office floor plan, but you can um, deal with timber within the space because it becomes part of the architecture and part of the, the feature. Um, another typology that we haven't talked as much about is, is um, <coughs> In the residential world, these there are a lot of examples in, in Europe um, and in Canada of CLT walls with CLT slabs, so full CLT buildings. That is the t a type of building that really is only going to be appropriate for residential hotel housing. Um, and I think that's something that has a lot of legs, but it's going to be, a, a lot of that's going to be covered. So it's more of a, a low cost and quick way to construct. Um, the, I think the, the Alabama project mm -hmm. you showed is kind of an example of that, but um, there are ways to maybe architecturally make it a little bit more interesting, but um, I, I, that, is, that is a typology that has already taken off in Europe and in the UK. I think there's a, a um, to interject, a, a question to pose back, which is what is the type that's most in need of a, what is the most type that's most in crisis? Right, so where do we dedicate our energy to focusing adoption of this technology? And I, I would posit that housing, we have a housing crisis. I don't know if we have a um, makerspace crisis, um, <laughs> but we do have a housing crisis, right? And so as Andrew showed last night, and as, as, as your project shows too, Tom, housing to me is, is a place where, again, knowing that we build out of blocks and planks here in New York City with for all of their Benefits, there are also great detriments. Um, I think that that's one way to look at, is to ask the question, what type is most in need of addressing construction technology? Um, 
I, I also was taught like the axiom, like cost, speed, quality, choose two, right? So if you choose cost and speed, low cost, high speed, then quality suffers. If you choose speed and quality, the cost goes up, right? You can only choose two. That's always that sort of always how I was taught to look at projects. And I think one of the opportunities or the one of the, maybe it's just a optimism, is that maybe Mass Timber can actually entitle all three, right? It might be lower cost, it might be higher quality, and it can go up faster. So maybe it's maybe it's a unicorn. And I think that's because it can be done in the shop. Like concrete is right. just too heavy, it just right. doesn't make sense, right? Yeah. There are a couple more questions here. Um, I have two questions. One is uh, within the seven story range or something, the biggest uh, <coughs> sort of economic uh, competitors would be like block and plank or uh, low gauge steel. So has, has there been any comparisons to those construction systems? That's question one. And the other one is um, I haven't seen any um, examples of how mechanical systems, electrical systems, can be incorporated into uh, these types of buildings. Any ideas on that? So in terms of cost, I think any cost system, you have to kind of kind of take it with a grain of salt because you're comparing an industry that's just that's still fairly nascent in, in the United States with an industry that's had 100 years to mature for steel and concrete, right? So you're never going to get an apple-to-apple -apple comparison in terms of the inherent potential of that. Talk about it in, in 10, 50, 20, or 50 years when this has, when your future has arrived, I think we could get a true, a more truer sense of that comparison. And because of that, there is a premium right now. But there's also projects where uh, the premium factor is negated by the speed of construction, all of these things. And uh, you know, it's like, I, I think it's a question that everybody asks me: like, Was it going to cost more? And and the, my answer is: Well, it depends what you want and and what are the factors because. Depending on those things, a mass timber building could be more expensive at the same cost, or it can be cheaper even. So you really have to get into the delve into the details. I'm afraid. Yeah. Yeah, I would say you know specifically for block and plank and light gauge and and um, you know light stud framing. The I don't know that there's been a lot of like very serious studies because mass timber is currently definitely more expensive than those uh, materials. That's why. It's been, it's more in a, um, can be more on par with, you know, flat plate construction or, or um, steel, structural steel construction. Um, I think it does certainly have the ability for the cost to come down once the, the um, manufacturing is, is built in the U.S., but it just, it, it isn't at, it isn't at, you know, we've, we've looked at many projects where the alternative is kind of, um, light stud framing on a concrete podium uh, for a, you know a four-story mixed-use space and you just can't win out on cost right now against those projects but um one day we might <laughs> and you know, in, the mechanical system oh yeah and in terms of mechanical systems and electrical systems that's a, a really great question um the benefit of of the cnc fabrication that happens in advance is that you can route out the openings and the um and and everything that you need to incorporate those systems into your project the one thing that this does though is it means that you really need a high level of coordination on your mep systems at a much earlier stage of design and in a lot of traditional construction you might leave that coordination until you're out in the field and then you're kind of dealing with it with you know overlays with the with the subs um, you really, you you can do that with timber. Um, you know, you can go out and, and pretty easily cut a hole in, in a timber system to put a new to put your conduits or, or whatever through, but you lose a lot of the prefabrication benefits. So on projects where you really want to get the most like bang for your buck, you really need to have your um, your mechanical uh, engineer um, and all of that. All of the coordination needs to happen in 3D, coordinated with the structural model, with the fabrication model, um, so that so that that's all dealt with in advance. Hi. I have a question about software and opportunities for collaboration. Um, in my own practice as a designer and builder, I'm an advocate for parametric design, which I use to develop large-scale building projects uh, with a very small team, sometimes only myself. Um, but by engaging 
the software in conjunction with CNC technology. I'm able to control the design, the engineering, assembly, fabrication, installation, everything, kind of, you know, the full spectrum. Um, so I was interested in both presentations, and if you could talk a little more about how the software and technology that's available today um, advances both control and collaboration. Yeah, I think so. The, the f I think I'll start off by saying that uh, the, crit the most critical thing is that regardless of what your design process is, it has to include that digital modeling. Right. Because if you don't, then translating that to whoever the supplier and the fabricator is, that's, you know, it's, it's, you're going you're gonna to get into it for obvious reasons. There's going to be a lot of trouble, right? Exactly. But the way architecture process, uh, process is, is that it's pretty much everybody is now doing three-dimensional modeling. Mm -hmm. And the good thing about that software transition is it's not necessarily the software that you're using, that the CNC fabricators are using, but it's translatable, right? So, uh, and, and you're never going to, as a, unless you're a design build, as an architect or an engineer mm -hmm. working on the design side, you're never modeling your model to that level of every single connection, every screw where that is. But if, you, if you've done it in a model that you could pass on to the supplier, then right. they take that model and they could use that as a basis to set up their own model with all of the necessary information that can then uh, translate and communicate with the CNC machine to produce the shop drawings, the submittals, all of that, so that from that point on is seamless. Right. right? So, so the technology is there and, and I think that's, that's necessary. Sure. Um, sorry, S specifically in the in the software, some sometimes we can develop a specific model that will have all of that um, combined: the the engineering, the even down to the whole patterning and the um, the fabrication mm -hmm. and the and the drawing. Steve, mm -hmm. um, do you have any additional comments? Well, I think so. It also depends on the scale too, sure, right? Yeah. I think if it's a small project where you can look at all of those details, then then you can make you can make that work and you could start your model in something like CAD works, I suppose, right? But then you would need the expertise of how to feed that information with the algorithms of the CNC fabrication equipment to do that in a way that's uh, effective and, and, and cost, uh, cost effective and makes sense, right? So, so yeah, yes, you can do that, but given how larger the scale of projects are, it tends to still be very uh, divided and it can, I think it can be more, uh, tied together, but in my experience, it hasn't been there yet. Uh, the, the, the little example that I showed about the parametric modeling, it, you know, again, it's, it's just a limited, it was just kind of a smart use of just using a little bit of that potential to do what made sense for in our, in our case, right? And so you can plug in different softwares that talk to each other to help your, it's, it's just another tool in your kit to work. Yeah, I think the other thing to, to add is that depending on the different manufacturers have different size CLT panels that they use. They have slightly different connections that they like to use and different ways that they like to detail. Um, and so if you are on the design side before the manufacturer has been chosen, which is often the case because you want to leave a competitive bid, um, there's only so much value to taking it to that level of detail before they're on board because you will likely have to change it to suit their... Uh, you know, the way that they build. So if you have a project where you've brought a, a manufacturer on early, then, yeah, then you could maybe really go and, and get all of that exactly the way that you want it. But um, on a more traditional design bid build project, um, you, you you need to find the right balance of, <laughs> of yeah. detailing or detailing the really important aspects and leaving some of that for yeah. to, to suit the, the manufacturer. And yeah, that's a great point, because like if you're doing steel, you've got the steel manual, right? It doesn't matter where you get the steel from, that's the steel piece you're gonna get with CLT, whether you get it from Binder Holes, from Nordic, Structure Lamb, they're all, the makeup is slightly different, the species are different, so, and I think this is one of yeah. the that's issues the of an emerging, the they can yeah, make is different. it's the emerging technology and in this industry that there's no standardization yet, but I think they're trying to get there. Hey, why don't we have one more question? Um, from the back on the left. Yep. Hi. Um, jumping back uh, to the scale of the, of the city and of production of these buildings, I was thinking about, uh, Andy, your question about uh, what happens to labor um, in, in our current condition where we have such a building boom going on here. I wonder if you guys could speak to um, Andy's um, 
proposition that you know in this in this future that we we want to be in uh, where this this type of construction is going on in tight urban settings can you guys talk about the challenges and the opportunities for the way buildings get built I think about how you know in in New York City right now where there's you know construction everywhere and what that it literally changes the way we move through the city and thinking about uh, CLT construction you know on tight urban lots um, kind of wondering is it uh, are is it would it be very different or very this or much like the same to plank construction um, just s better smelling planks of <laughs> material on streets uh, which would be nice um, or you know just how like uh, and especially with the role of the architect in combination with engineers in planning out staging and you know how these things uh, would go up mm -hmm. you know imagining a let's say a street of tight um, lots that are all getting constructed at uh, you know similar times something like that. Yeah, I think Michelle touched upon this before right it's 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 definitely quieter and it's not a site intensive but you have to do things in the right way so you have to do a lot of organization and logistics beforehand so for instance our, our design building in Arkansas we, we've sort of done that halfway we didn't go all the way through and we're seeing some of the challenges of what we could have done better but, in, but if it all works out well, you should be able to get as much of this produced in the shop, delivered on site, picked off of a flatbed of a truck, and installed. And, and that truck stays there for the one or two hours or whatever, and these are being delivered in the right order, so you don't have to like separate them out and you don't need a staging area. So it can be done. It's in terms of like, is it being done to that level right now? It's probably not yet, I would say not yet. Uh, but those are the, it's, I, and so it's ideal for tight urban areas, given that there's less construction type, uh, construction time on the field, as well as just the length of construction and the quietness of construction. It's so ideal. Well, one, one other thing to add that we ha I didn't mention before is that a, some, a, a challenge that does need to be addressed in timber construction, uh, particularly in a tight urban environment, is that you do need a fire safety plan under construction. That's when the buildings are most vulnerable. Um, the one example of a mass timber building catching fire was while it was in construction. Um, they did ultimately rebuild it again in mass timber, so they didn't find that it was a, a you know an, uh, an issue that they couldn't deal with. But that is. Um, that is something you know you, you can't be doing welding like right next to your like pile of sawdust so you just have to <laughs> have it. Um, so there, there are resources out there but that is something that is slightly different and and it's a, a the, probably the the only area where the, the safety is is worse for timber than other than other buildings uh, Andy can we do one more I was yeah yeah one sure between one more. David and sure. Jeremy yes <laughs> sorry Wrote it down. So you mentioned uh, the extended engineering and architectural design cycles, and I'm assuming that it's reasonable to expect that collaboration and build as collaboration and building continues, that more standard and proven catalogs of connections will emerge and reduce the time required in finding viable solutions. Additionally, as you were saying, coupled with reduced learning curve on both the designers the engineers and the architects, and as we build standardization, as the uh, typologies uh, mature and the building processes mature. Do you see that as like the learning curve is going to go in that direction? I is what I, um, I'd like to hear your view on. Yeah, I, certainly, and I, 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 I definitely think that right now there's only a certain number of you know tested connections and tested wall assemblies that are available to designers, so you have this kind of small toolkit that you can work with, and then otherwise you're either starting at first principles uh, in your design or you're doing some testing, um, which adds time on the design side. And I think as it becomes more common, all of these manufacturers will have kind of a larger suite of products that have been tested to American standards, which will really tick off the box for a lot of um, more standard projects. And then, you know, for your really like showcase type projects, you're probably still going to be doing some something beyond that but that you know that's that's to be expected and would fall within a normal design phase there and i think also it depends on the types of buildings are you doing i think form and shape have a lot of consequence to that so uh, again you can standardize these things and if you have a cookie cutter building let's say 
then where all the parameters are parameters and circumstances that you've encountered before in design, then yes, you know what that's going to be. But if, if, if it's a complex form or you're, doing, you're trying to do something more innovative, then those are new conditions. And so those will have its own challenges once you start, even if you've uh, pre-planned everything, once that comes into the construction site, those will present its own challenges. So it's another learning curve and you just, you just kind of, you gain more knowledge from, from one project to the next and collectively together as engineers and architects, we share that and, and kind of increase the collective knowledge of, of what are the lessons learned in the, in the field. Yeah, correct, right. correct. It's, it's just that I think in the other, other structural systems, that knowledge is already there to some degree. And, but also in wood, because it is a more susceptible material, you know, it, it, with water, all of these things, things that you don't have to necessarily worry about, concrete or steel, you're finding that, okay, because it's wood, now it's like you gotta pay attention to it. Yeah, so and I, I think the one thing, the one change though that in the design side that is more likely to be permanent is that the need for coordination during design rather than saving it for construction is, is really important to use the benefits of mass timber um, for the prefabrication. So that's something that is just going to push a lot of that coordination earlier in the process and I think that stays and is probably a good thing anyways. So I'd like to thank Michelle and Tom for their time, their presentations, their thoughtful answers to the audience's excellent questions. Um, did you want, David, do you want to make any announcements about the rest of the day, just to remind people about the schedule? Um, other than to uh, remind everyone to come back at 1, because we have the second panel, uh, Unhealthy Living Timber at 1 o'clock. Uh, there are lots of places to have lunch around. Uh, there's also a lunch place upstairs, I believe, on the third floor of this building that you can go to. So. Uh, look forward to seeing you all back here at one and thank the panel very much. Thank you.